Thank you. All right, Peter, it's noon. Shall we hit it? I think we should get going. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Hanewald. I'm the assistant head of school at One Schoolhouse for professional development. And I'm joined here by Peter. Peter, do you want to introduce yourself while I pull up some slides? Sure, Sarah. I'm the independent curriculum resource director at One Schoolhouse. And we're both very excited to be here to talk about uh, a subject that's near and dear to both of our hearts, which is helping new teachers succeed in new schools. So teachers who are new to schools, teachers who are new to teaching, all of the above. So we're uh, here to and we called it, it takes more than a week because we started this conversation last week <laughs> and we realized we had more to say than could be done in a week. So um, as a reminder, this is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel and there will be a transcript on our webpage. Peter, do you want to just talk a little bit about the first two of these? Sure. Um, the, uh, the first two inv involves uh, a handbook that really tells people what it's like to live at your school, a handbook that has um, sort of anthropological uh, features. And uh, we have a downloadable teacher handbook on our uh, independent curriculum pages, uh, as well as a webinar on that handbook. I have just posted the links for those in the chat and you can, uh, at the end of the, or any time you can print the chat from this uh, webinar by clicking on the three little dots that are over there to the right of uh, the message panel at the bottom of the chat. And one of the options is going to be print chat. And if you print that out, you'll have this uh, information available to you or save chat, I guess. So you can save it and print it. You can save it and just click the links. But a handbook that really tells teachers what it's like to be a part of your community, what it's like to be a part of the culture that also has little helpful hints on, you know, where to park, how to get coffee, uh, what we do about grading, what the process for comment writing is likely to be like around our place. Every school is different in so many ways. And so this is an important thing that resource, I think that, that every new teacher needs in any school. Absolutely. And if you're like me, maybe you open it a new tab because you only have 20 tabs open at the same time. So open in numbers 21 and 22. <laughs> and then the third one is modeling the same tech your teachers are using. We touched on this a little bit last week, but in the intervening week, I have heard just from some really creative and thoughtful people who are building Canvas courses on getting to know our school, who have built Microsoft class notebooks on here's your handbook in notebook form. And by the way, we've integrated videos that you can click on and meet some of the people who you can't meet on campus right now, but they're going to tell you a little bit about their role. So I'm really impressed. Thank you. So often schools will open just like one schoolhouse does. This is for the parent meeting of parents whose students are taking one schoolhouse courses. And you may have something similar where you talk about how many faculty members you have, what degrees they hold, how many students they have per section. But I really want to talk about this um, training piece. So one of the things that we talk about is what does it take to become a one schoolhouse teacher if you're already an experienced independent school teacher? And I think there's a real opportunity here for schools to think about that how do we onboard new teachers into our school and our culture so that it also is a point of pride and something that you want to uh, make part of a presentation at the beginning of the year. So Peter, we love backwards design at One Schoolhouse. So you and I were talking, backwards design applies here too, doesn't it? It absolutely does, Sarah. And you know, start with, this is something we, we think that you perhaps ought to do when you're in the hiring process, the recruiting process, is to imagine what does a successful teacher look like at your school? What is it, what, how does that person fit in? What do they bring to the community? What does the community expect of them? How does someone fit into your culture? How does someone succeed in your culture as a, as a teacher and in all the other roles that being a part of that community uh, entails? And if you have really gone into this, you can imagine markers of success. 
Uh, I know a, a handful of schools have even done a, you know, picture the teacher exercise, kind of like the uh, picture the graduate exercise. But what does it look like to succeed at your school? Survival is not enough. Contract renewal is not enough. We're talking about success here. So again, when you begin with that end in mind, I'm going to share something that is loosely based on experience that I've had at a couple of different schools combined as if it all happened at one, um, because that's the way we do models sometimes. But a year-long curriculum for becoming a member of the faculty at your fabulous school. Here you are. And so one of the things that we found really helpful is to use some protocols for some meetings. And I wanna give a shout out to someone who's not here in the webinar, at least I didn't see her, but Jennifer Rundles at St. Mary's School went to Critical Friends and came back after that training and said, hey, I think we can use this in our onboarding of new faculty. And if you're not familiar with that, definitely I recommend checking it out. Don't have a professional relationship there, so, um, or even an insider's view or anything. So that's just a, just a shout out there. Um, so it's a PLC format and it was led by a non-evaluative administrator. So this is not someone who was actually making the decision at the end of the year, yes, this person is gonna get a renewal or not. Although, you know, I recognize that that's a slippery slope, right? If, and we all know that, so we'll be upfront about that. So the course or PLC met monthly during required lunch meetings. If you don't have faculty lunch as part of your plan, I would consider buying everybody lunch and letting them meet in a separate space so that it doesn't get hard to pull people together. Um, and then during the course of the year, everything was tied to what was happening at that time of the year with guest speakers from various areas of the school who might stay for the whole time or who might give a quick presentation and leave. And so an example of that might be during a key time in your admissions cycle. Well, not during, because you can't get the admissions director to come then, but maybe just ahead of or just after. The director of admissions would come and say, you know, we're about to have our invite back time period where everyone we've accepted is gonna come back to campus and make their decision. And this is key. And what's your role here? You know, what is the teacher's role in that time of year? Peter, are there other key times of year and key administrators that you'd share? Oh, there are lots of key times of the year. Terms end and start. Athletic seasons end and start. Oftentimes those are uh, happening simultaneous with arts seasons that are beginning and, and, uh, and ending. So all of these things are important. One of the little features in the handbook that we recommend doing is in fact a a walk through the year at your school. What, what, what are the salient issues and the salient things to think about as the year progresses for teachers? Obviously, there are, you know, grades and comments, things like that that matter a lot. And other things that may not seem like they matter. You may be at a school where the, you know, parent auction is the uh, giant event of the year, but if new teachers don't understand that it's not just a thing for parents but it's a big deal. Um, they won't understand what the what the fuss might be all about when it actually happens. Things like yeah, that. There's a lot of mysterious things that happen during the year, aren't there? So we broke our year up into roughly thirds. And when I say we, I mean Peter and I as we were putting this together, because your mileage may vary. There may be some schools that wait until sort of deep into the middle of the year to have parents come onto campus. There might be schools that do those parent conferences earlier in the year. So this is our estimate of where these things are in thirds, but I don't want anybody to get too caught up on that. So the first third of that new faculty members year is how do I teach my class? How am I an advisor and how do I join this community? The depth of challenge there is going to vary, right? If you've hired somebody who's moved to your state as a trailing spouse and who has 20 years of experience in a school quite a bit like yours in another state, there's still going to be changes. And then you add in layers of people who are transitioning different kinds of schools or early career teachers, and then those things can be even more challenging. So 
thinking about who the primary people are and who additional key players are matters with this kind of thing. And at your school, it may be different, right? Some of these people may move around and maybe it depends on the position that the person is in. But really hammering some of this out ahead and thinking it through will help you help those new teachers. And it's also important to try to build in points of contact uh, where the new teachers can learn things that they need to learn in order to be supported and to support the programs that are run by the DEI officers, by the athletic director, by the res life person. Uh, it's not just a matter of uh, howdy in the halls, it's, it's how, to, how can you learn to be in those roles as, as a more effective professional and as a more effective uh, guide and mentor for students. Absolutely. And so we thought about what are the things that leadership needs to be doing or making sure that happens during that first third of the year when a new teacher is settling in, building relationships with students and getting on a roll with their courses. And one is that walkabout drop in, you know, where sticking your nose in, saying hello, friendly look, you know, how are things going? And then weekly check ins with your mentor. If you don't set the expectation that mentors and mentees will meet often at the beginning, then it's too easy for it to become a, hey, do you need to chat anything? No, everything's great, even if it's not. Um, and then it becomes a meet when we have a problem. And that's not really how you wanna set up mentoring. Um, department chairs or grade level chairs, and your mileage may vary on this. You may have instructional coaches instead of department chairs but somebody who is really helping that teacher figure out how do I teach here? You know, am I doing this the right way? Um, and then there's non-evaluative observations and feedback for that. So that we're not evaluating right away. It's hard to say that, yes, it's not evaluative when somebody's in the room and watching, but as much as you can getting that message in. And then technology. This is where I think we make mistakes with folks. We think, oh, this person's really tech savvy. Their skills are gonna transfer and they will, but sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And it could turn out that things are, you know, a little bit harder for someone or they're doing something in a really inefficient way and they're frustrated with the learning management system or maybe the projector in their room is shutting down and all we need to do is replace a bulb, but they don't know that. So you wanna do that good tech check-in because tech friction is really frustrating. And then that senior admin check-in, that one-on-one, -on -one, let's have a talk. How are things going? How do you feel? Just establishing that relationship before you get into evaluation mode. Peter, what do you want to add on this slide? Uh, not a whole lot, although uh, this might be the moment for us to say that um, we understand that this year is going to be unlike any other year that any school has ever experienced. Uh, and therefore, everything that we're suggesting here, or recommending here, is going to be subject to lots of variability. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit later. Uh, we have a question already about how do you do the drop-ins in a virtual landscape. Uh, we have some thoughts on that. We'll come to that. But it's, uh, and it's, it's part of the everything is going to be different. But this is sort of the the baseline in an ideal world we're giving you right now. And uh, we know we're not living in this ideal world right now, but hopefully uh, we can adapt a lot of what we're doing, what we want to do in the ideal world to the world in which we're going to be living. And we'll, we'll try to talk about that later. We don't have all the answers because nobody does right now. But right. We are hearing some in terms of technology because to campus technology for new teachers is hopefully on, on its way right now. And so tech departments are doing some socially distance one-on-one -on -one orientations to new equipment and resources on campus. So that middle third of the year, here's where sort of the rubber is hitting the road in some ways in terms of communication. You've got that parent-teacher conference or maybe you have a back to school night and something that I used to ask teachers to do was get with a partner and prepare. How do you 
say your actual welcome to parents if you're doing a back to school night. What, how will you introduce yourself? Those are things that teachers who are not comfortable being in front of a group of, of people who they haven't met before, a little practice or role playing can really help. Now, there's other things that are starting to happen. At this point, you want a new teacher to have attended another arts event, hit a couple of games, starting to blend into that culture and starting to understand, oh, this is why, you know, the senior song fest in the fall is a big deal, you know, starting to figure out some of those keys to the culture. And so your mileage may vary on who the primary people and other key players are. Um, Peter and I had an interesting conversation about the importance of the registrar with grade reporting. Sometimes they are absolutely the person you need, and sometimes they're still the mysterious person who makes it work behind the scenes. Peter, what else do you want to add here? Uh, I don't think I have very much to add here, but I think uh, it's absolutely true that, uh, you know, especially as teachers, new teachers sort of get more deeply into their role as advisors, really understand their advisees, have begun to develop some relationships with advisees uh, as they may be embarking on their role as a leader of an activity or a, a coach of some sort, um, how that all works. Uh, this is where conversations with the counseling department, with the learning uh, support people, with the DEI people, all of these conversations uh, are going to become more important that this is, they're going to have substance now and not just going to be, here's what you need to know. It's, now That's, it's going to be, here's what you need to think about and talk about and how to respond in this particular situation with this particular student. That's a great point. And I think you go from the introductory to the substantive in this middle third. And I said, made a list of things that might cause challenges, right? So this is where if you've got the notebook of exemplary comments that you can share, whether it's electronic or a physical notebook with someone who hasn't done comment writing before, you know, help them learn the culture there rather than having them struggle along the way. Um, just because maybe 30 years ago, new teachers were thrown in and it was sink or swim doesn't mean we need to do it that way anymore. So we've got some evaluative observations. Absolutely, the focus is still on support but you know you don't want to do one high stakes evaluation in early May and that's the first time that's happened. Parent guardian conferences, sometimes those can cause challenges. Sometimes a new teacher encounters, you know, maybe they've replaced someone beloved and all of the parents have had their an older child go through that course and they want to know why is it different now. So really helping teachers through some of these challenges and likely at some point during this middle third, there will be a discipline issue of some kind. Hopefully it's minor, um, but, but something's gonna come up. And so supporting a new teacher in that and helping them learn how your school deals with those kinds of things. And also then just to continue the check-ins, make, you know, continue the conversations that are going on. Um, another sort of caveat here, I think, um, is that this is all predicated on a situation where things are going well, obviously, and we need to say this out loud so that nobody thinks we have forgotten about it. In a situation where there is, you know, where there's a, a, a fire, you need to respond more quickly, differently. If there's a real sense that a, a hire is not working out well, that something happens, Clearly, those things need to be dealt with uh, in the way that you would normally deal with those situations, whether the teacher is new or, or a veteran. Um, it, you know, when you're talking about something that could look like cause, and we know what cause means in independent schools, it's why you get fired. Uh, but this is really, um, you know, this is assuming things are going well. This is trying to be, and you know, imagining a supportive culture with everything kind of going as well as it usually does for new teachers. So just to put that out there. That is a great point. Thank you, Peter. So then there's the third third. <laughs> and this is wrapping up the year well. For this new faculty member, it's finding their voice and decide, defining their identity in the school, culture, and community. You know, Ms. Hanawald is the one who 
coaches the robotics team, which I have never done. So just, but you know, finding that spot, you know, taking on those leadership roles and taking on those corners of the, oh, you know, you go talk to Mr. Gal if you've got a question about this. So that means that the primary people, that's really gonna vary, right? Depending on where someone is and how that's going. Peter, talk a little bit, if you will, about the head of school and the immediate supervisor in terms of that, hey, great, we want you to come back next year conversation that needs to happen here. Sure, and, and we all know that the roles uh, that heads of school play in schools vary. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, a general thing and you could extrapolate from it as you wish. But you know, ultimately it's the head of school's signature who's on that uh, on the contract as the contract goes to be renewed. But we'd like to believe that by the, the third third of the year, especially the head of school is aware of the new teacher and what their strengths are, what their voice and what their identity are and what they mean in the community. And that this becomes a part of the basis for decisions being made around rehiring. Uh, we hope that that uh, information comes to the head from you know their their personal experience and observation but we also know that the teachers immediate supervisors whoever they might be who play key roles in determining whether this person has been performing effectively and is an effective part of the community and should be invited back um, those are all important parts of the conversation but uh, certainly, whether the school is larger or small, by the end of the year, it would be great if, um, if, if when uh, the head of school looks at Mr. Gao, he thinks, oh, Mr. Gao, yeah, he's the guy, he, he does these things, and uh, kids seem to like him, and I remember that funny joke he told in morning meeting, whatever it might be, or the really bad joke he told in morning meeting, more like. Well, it can so. be both, right? Absolutely. Be the big goofball that it is really finding his voice in our school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so planning ahead for the kinds of things that can cause challenges for new faculty members, final assessments for students, particularly if someone is, um, you know, changing, I want to say style, right? Does that final assessment, is it too big? Is it too small? Is it a good match for the school culture. Year end activities, knowing what you've got to go to, what you don't have to go to, what's for you to participate in, and all of those things. And then of course, the conversations continue. About contract renewal. Yeah. So how does this change in a pandemic? And one of the things you've got to do is make sure that for new people to your school, they understand that maybe in January 2022, when they're looking around and saying, oh, aren't we supposed to do X, Y, Z? Oh, no, that was just last year. Um, some schools have come up with some really fantastic alternate traditions that they may decide to move into the permit tr tradition category. But on the other hand, you can't just add and not take away. So if you're not sunsetting something, if you're adding in all the cool stuff you did this spring, think about that. But make that really clear to someone that they need to understand this completely because it's going to keep on happening or this is a one-time thing and next year we're not going to do it that way. Figuring out what's virtual, what's online, and what's not online. I think I actually meant to put in there. <laughs> Sorry about that. But we're going to be hybrid, right? We're going to be going back and forth. And what are the things that are absolutely essential to be in person? And what are the things that you're going to push to online? Where are the students? Where are the teachers? And how is that changing all the time? And one of the things that I want to point out on this particular screen, so if you see, if depending on how you're looking at the slides, if you're looking at the gallery, you'll see that Sarah Hanewald is here, Peter Gao is here, and then this mysterious muted Zoom administrator with a little icon. This is something that I really recommend if you're doing lots of remote courses and you want to pop into some of the live experiences with students. Having a symbol that, rec that represents you, but is not as distracting, particularly if you are, you know, a 
somebody, somebody who your presence could put a damper on things and have kids and teachers be used to this person popping in and out or this symbol popping in and out as you visit in on the live synchronous classes because that is a master task in organizational feats. And if you've got somebody on campus who is a master at logistics and who is maybe being underutilized because sports teams aren't traveling in mini buses all over town, you may want that person to make you a phenomenal calendar-based spreadsheet that's got links and passwords and codes so that you can pop in and out when things are synchronous. But don't mistake the synchronous for being the only way that school is happening. The other thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is really look under the, under the hood at the learning management system and see the interactions that are happening. I'm able to do that with our facilitators in our courses this summer. I've got a real sense of their voice because I see how they answer the participants and I see how they build their relationships in just a couple of weeks. And you'll have a much deeper sense of that in your learning management system when you read those interactions. Of course, you want to look at the assignments because you want to see, you know, that the assignments are still meeting your curricular goals as a school, but those interactions are going to be really key to see. Peter, we only have a couple of minutes for questions, so I'm going to ask you if you have anything to add here. And then we're done. Looking at the question panel, and, and we've apparently answered everyone's questions so far, um, but I uh, wonder if we have a, any other questions. Now is the moment, please. And if you've got something brilliant that you're doing that you want to share, I would love to have someone come up and um, say, hey, look, turn on my mic and let me share a little bit about this. So put that in there, if you will. And then I would be remiss if I didn't say we've got a course that starts next week, Introduction to Independent Schools. So if you have hired someone who's transitioning into independent schools and you're wondering, gosh, how are we going to have this person understand what does it mean to be at an independent school? Um, we'd love to have that faculty member join us. And you can find that on our website under um, for educators. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm also going to add one more thing in the chat. Um, Sarah, which is the uh, Academic Leaders Listserv is also a great way for people to uh, get information, share information, resources, questions, ideas, and I just put in the chat the link to uh, joining the Academic Leaders Listserv. Great. Please, please do Thank if you, you have. So there are, and there are some really interesting conversations going on there. And I think we are at least getting to a point where things are starting to become a little bit more clear. Although we've just learned a new word in the last 24 hours, thanks to Forbes magazine, apparently, which is concurrent teaching, which is uh, when you have kids in both places at once uh, on campus and online. So yeah, if we, if we didn't have enough new vocabulary that we are learning, now we've got a new one. Sounds like, so does anybody have a resource to share? Feel free to throw it in the chat or just an observation to make. Would love to have you join us. We've got one minute. Um, you hang around. Well, in the meantime, thank you to everyone for being here for, um, we have some, some loyal, loyal listeners. Thank you for that. And, uh, <laughs> Even the holiday week. So I know lots of folks are closed this week. Indeed. So yes, they probably should be, but here we are. All right. Well, thank you all. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Bye. Sarah. Bye. Thank you, Peter.